Good evening and welcome to the opening of the library's fourth annual interdisciplinary exhibit, Food Justice in Appalachia. I'm Karen Diaz, Dean of Libraries. In this brave new world that the pandemic has brought us, I'm coming to you asynchronously, asynchronously from outside of the library, while some of you are currently in the library or coming in live from your homes. The art of gathering has certainly changed. The Art in the Libraries program, which is run by our exhibits coordinators, coordinator, Sally Brown, has blossomed beyond what I envisioned it could be when it started in 2017 when we hired Sally. This program has created dozens of exhibits across our library system, some of which have traveled to other libraries and has hosted even more programs, both in person and online. These exhibits have served to educate, delight, and build community around important issues in our world and on our campus, and have provided opportunity for faculty and staff research to find new voice, and for faculty and staff hobbies to shine as well. Food Justice in Appalachia is the fourth of the year-long exhibits that highlight the Art in the Libraries program. Each annual exhibit has taken an issue of importance and combine scholarship, artistry, community engagement, and good design to spotlight the issue. Food Justice in Appalachia does just that, and I'm looking forward to hearing from a couple of our campus experts on this topic. These exhibits provide an opportunity for WVU to engage with the topic through programming, course integration, and collaboration amongst researchers. Our librarians have created helpful resources that serve as companion pieces that can be found online with the online version of the exhibit. Each exhibit involves quite a process from conception of an idea to finding subject matter experts to collaborate with, outlining the themes, calling for content, reviewing and selecting the content, researching the issue for text that will accompany the visuals, working with a designer to create an attractive and cohesive design, and fundraising to cover the costs of marketing, programming, and printing uh, and installing the exhibit. This year, we're so grateful to the sponsors who provided financial support to make this possible. These include a large number of campus sponsors the WVU Humanity Center, a generous grant from the WVU Health Promotion and Wellness Program, the Eberly College of Arts and Sciences, the Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, the College of Creative Arts, the Davis College of Agriculture, Natural Resources, and Design, the Office of the Provost Transform This Challenge Grant, and the Division of Student Life. Important off-campus sponsors include MPB Print and Sign Superstore, the West Virginia Department of Agriculture, and the West Virginia Humanities Council. Supporters include Mike and Tammy Miller on behalf of Pantry's Pantry Plus More, the Art, Arts Council of Greater Morgantown, and the West Virginia Convention and Visitors Bureau, and Catherine Wilson-Jones. We're thrilled so many of you are in our facility to see the on-site exhibit and engage in networking around this important topic. I invite those of you joining from home to make your way to our downtown library when you're able to and enjoy the exhibit physically. If you're not Thank able you so to come, much, we Karen. also encourage you to engage <laughs> with the online version here. of the exhibit. Digitally, thank you. Thank you for joining well. us. So now and I'd like to welcome our first presenter. Evening. I contacted WVU Food Policy Research Director Joshua Lowens last summer about helping develop and curate this exhibition around food justice in Appalachia. And he immediately signed on. His expertise and contribution, including outlining and writing most of the themes, educational introductions, and contextualizing the work, as well as introducing me to Turn Row Appalachian Farm Collective, the other main exhibit partner, among others, was key in making this exhibition come together. Thank you, Joshua, for your time and dedication, along with your full-time position to this project. Welcome, welcome, Joshua. Thank you, Sally. I'm glad that it's finally here. 
It's been a, a long road since that initial email and in, was it May of last year? In the midst of all of us trying to figure out how to do work, questioning what we're doing as work. Um, and yeah, dealing with my um, trying to figure that out together. So I also wanna thank uh, Karen for her introductory remarks and opening this space uh, for us to have a conversation about food justice this year. Um, thank you to all of the artists. Um, reviewing your work was humbling and overwhelming at times, um, but it's really wonderful to see it now displayed and I look forward to the spring physical display coming up. And thank you to all of the partners um, over the years that have made the conversation about food justice in Appalachia possible. Um, April is here representing Turner Appalachian Farm Collective and also representing hundreds of organizations across the state working toward a more just food future. And um, this exhibit would also not be possible without our partners uh, through which I have learned uh, a lot over the past years. So today is World Food Day. I don't know how many of you knew that. Um, so we're not the only ones celebrating food today. All across the world, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization has designated October 16th as a day for us to reflect on what it means to be eaters and um, yeah, spur global conversations about this. And um, it's an important time to be doing that because last year, if you all remember back to March of 2020, we were all kind of wondering like, hmm, am I gonna be able to get food tomorrow? Right? A lot of us were filling up our carts and uh, going a little bit crazy, grocery store shelves were empty. Um, I signed up for a double CSA share you know, usually I just did the half share and I was like, I better just do the full share this year. Um, and throughout the world, we've been having conversations about food. We um, just went through the Nobel Peace Prize process again, um, but the awardee all of last year was the World Food Program. You remember that? The height of the pandemic, uh, hundreds of millions of people going hungry and Nobel elevating this organization that actually feeds vulnerable people. Um, for me, that was interesting because I had spent the last six years studying humanitarian food networks here in West Virginia. We often think of feeding lines and food disasters as something that happens far away, currently perhaps in Yemen or in Somalia or in Afghanistan, but every day, in this state, people line up for food. Um, in 2014, WVU had its first Food Justice Day. It was uh, a very, very small event in the free speech zone uh, coming out of a class called Food Justice in the geography department. And part of our uh, assignment in that grad seminar was to initiate a public conversation about food. We've had Food Justice Day seven times now. Actually, no, just six, because we did not have it last year. Um, and yesterday, it was wonderful to celebrate Food Justice Day in conjunction with the launch of this event. Uh, for me, it was really special because I was there for the first Food Justice Day, and now we're inaugurating not food justice day, but food justice year, right? For an entire year, we're gonna be um, having conversations about food in this space. 30,000 students using the libraries will be encountering uh, themes of food justice and being forced to contend with some difficult themes at that. Um, so for me, this is a humbling moment, one that uh, feels you know, like it happened despite myself. 
um, but also a really special moment that the flagship library in our land grant university uh, would be advancing a conversation about the right to food. Food justice is the right of all people at all times in all places to have adequate access to healthy, nutritious, culturally appropriate food. Now that's a huge goal, but it's an achievable goal. And often the cynicism of our world tells us it's not possible. And food justice activists are here to tell us, no, it is possible, but it's gonna take a lot of work and it's gonna take a lot of collective work and a lot of people power to reclaim some of the injustices that have permeated the food system for centuries now. Um, we're in a period of unprecedented environmental change. Uh, in two weeks, we're gonna have a conversation in Dublin about how we make sure to keep the planet not as um, hot as it could become if we don't change our ways. And that has massive implications for food. Um, farmers all across the world are already experiencing droughts, floods, interruptions. Um, and you know, for those of us that are not connected day to day to the process of producing food, that may seem like uh, something far away that doesn't matter to us. But you know, 90% of our broccoli comes from California. If we like broccoli, um, then we probably need to figure out how to try and get some of that to not be grown there. Um, food connects us most intimately with our environment. Right? We eat the environment. When we eat, we are eating soil and sun and water and all of the congealed labor that made food come about. And so the food justice movement is actually an environmental justice movement. And it, it grew out of the environmental justice movement in the 1970s, which was a movement led by people of color, experiencing uh, trauma in their communities from toxins being dumped in their rivers and on their land and rising up and saying, enough. And so food justice as an environment, environmental justice movement um, must contend with questions of racial justice, right? The histories of violence, exploitation, dispossession um, that we've thankfully continued to crack open this year uh, through the deaths of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and the thousands of other unnamed uh, people that are still experiencing violence on a day-to-day -day basis. Those histories go back, right? 450, 600 years. Um, the histories of uh, colonization, robbing of land, redistributing land uh, to certain types of people and then writing laws to make sure that um, those injustices stay coded into the way that we govern our societies. Um, and here in Appalachia, you know, in, in the exhibit, you'll see in the, in the food heritage section, food has been used as a biopolitical weapon in the past. Food is intense. It's like if you go on strike, you don't have access to the company store anymore. You can't eat. Um, so food justice is political. Um, but food is also an opportunity for liberation from systems of oppression. And that's why I like um, studying food and it's a, it's a very hopeful space uh, despite some of the difficulties we encounter. In the 1970s, the Black Panthers organized all across the country um, because their children were going to school hungry. And, You know, it was uh, another moment in our country of heightened racial tensions. The FBI was kind of like, what's going on with these Black Panthers? Um, and their activism translated directly to what we know today as the free breakfast program at the USDA. 
We celebrate that program today, but we have to remember the roots out of which it came from. Um, we have to reflect, we have to listen to the people experiencing oppression in our food system. That includes the people laboring to feed us every single day. And often those people um, are marginalized. They may not have legal status in our country. They may be doing very dangerous work with chemicals and um, meat packing plants that are um, endangering them even now, right? On the line as we're accelerating the rate that we're uh, cutting birds and chicken processing plants, et cetera. And so we need to reflect also food connects us to our environment, but it also connects us to one another, right? Most intimately, and when we sit around uh, a table together or prepare food together, it is uh, a social act. But more and more that social act is being uh, splintered by the corporate capture of our food system. Processes are being divorced from one another, right? We'll grow a whole bunch of soy over here and then ship it over uh, to another continent and then grow a bunch of pigs over there and then ship it back here. And so we're divorced from the processes in our uh, food supply chains. And we tend to not realize it until there's a big interruption like COVID, right? And then all of a sudden like, whoa, where's my food come from? What's going on? Um, we have this situation where we have massive amounts of food right now. We're in a productivist food system that pumps out efficiently a lot of food, a lot of calories. We're told this is for global food security. But every year we see more and more people going hungry. It's a paradox, right? And it's a paradox that somebody that wants to actually get involved in producing food sustainably has to often forego even minimum wage and be on uh, government assistance just to get by. So we have a lack of food sovereignty currently in the state and around the world. There's an erosion of food sovereignty. It's not completely gone. And what I love about uh, food justice in Appalachia and studying it here is that the strategies to access food are so diverse. Uh, we are a place with some of the uh, highest per capita small farmers in the country, right? We don't have large tracts of land with soy and corn growing on them. We're still um, small farmers, but a lot of them are aging out. And there's not much opportunity for somebody with $60,000 in student debt to get into farming right now. Um, at the same time, we produce a lot of the fertilizers that go out to the Midwest. Our entire chemical valley is actually producing fertilizer for this agro food system. It's really interesting paradoxes here in, in Appalachia that we need to lean into this year with this exhibit. We, I could keep going and going, right? We're being colonized by Dollar General. But at the same time, we have these really cool community grocer initiatives popping up, taking hybrids of food pantries and snap stretch markets and mashing them together. The food justice movement is a coastal movement. It's a California movement. It's a New England movement. It's a New York movement. It's where a lot of the scholarship comes out of. But from where I stand and having studied in Appalachia, we have a lot to say and to contribute to that movement. People need to hear from us. They need to hear from our stories and what's going on here. Our stories, our experiences, our voices, our heritage. Thank you so much for the lovely food today. Um, you know, we are one of the most food insecure states in the country, but we're also one of the most resilient states in the country. We're creative in the way that we address problems, but often we can get into this navel gazing about how resilient mountaineers are and how you know, tough we are without actually looking outward at what else is happening around the world. All across the world, there are resilient communities really fighting this fight for a much more just food future. And so we also need to be connecting to these global movements. Right? The global movement for food sovereignty, 
the movement for rights, not charity, labor movements, all the movements developing around the nexus between food and health, and frankly, the decommodification of food. Because when we turn food into something for profit, start, things start going just weird, frankly. It doesn't quite work. Food as a commodity doesn't quite work. The logics don't make sense. And what gives me hope right now is that we're having a conversation in this state about that. Um, the Food for All Coalition, the Turnrow Appalachian Farm Collective, we're actually talking with our delegates, our legislators. Um, there's transformation happening from the grassroots up. This year, um, a house working group on food insecurity formed. It's not just talking about hunger, but starting to ask questions about our own food sovereignty in West Virginia. And by the way, the state of West Virginia has $1.2 billion to spend by 2014. How much of that should be going toward food is a question that we're asking. And so I invite all of you to join us on that journey. Engage with the Food for All Coalition, uh, engage with the Center for Resilient Communities and the libraries over this next year as we put on events, as we bring in speakers, um, and as we advance the movement for the right to food. One of the most exciting pieces of legislation introduced for me is House Joint Resolution um, 30, which is panel eight downstairs. The right to food, food sovereignty, and freedom from hunger. That language is currently sitting in a committee in the House, and we need to get that resolution debated this winter. Um, and a whole bunch of people are helping us get there. We have uh, the Nourishing Networks curriculum, we have FoodLink, uh, a rich body of participatory action research and students and grad students and PhD students engaging. And um, a lot of this is possible thanks to Kristen in the SNAP-Ed group and uh, the Family Nutrition Program out of WVU Extension, who for the past six years have funded the development of the FoodLink project, the Nourishing Networks curriculum, and uh, my job. <laughs> so um, I'm really, really pleased to be the one to introduce Kristen McCartney, who is the director of the Family Nutrition Program and manages the work of, what is it, 48 extension agents all across our state who are every day working toward improving food access and more and more integrating concepts of food justice directly into their work. So Kristen, I'll pass the floor over to you. I didn't pay him to say that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So um, like Josh said, um, I'm Krista McCartney. I'm the director for the West Virginia SNAP-Ed program. And I also included Gina Wood, um, who's my co-director for the Family Nutrition Program. Um, together, the Family Nutrition Program is funded by the USDA um, through SNAP-Ed, um, which of course is food stamp, the old food stamp program. Um, we're the educational arm of that program. And then FNEP, which is another nutrition program specific to extension. So two separate funding sources from the USDA that we administer together um, because they have very similar um, outreach strategies and, and objectives. Um, so I, through pictures, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we do. I'm not as eloquent as Josh and I didn't really plan um, what I was gonna say. I was just um, gonna let as we go through, you see a little bit about our work. Um, so to start out, I'm a dietitian by trade. So when Josh talks about food and how it connects us and where we come from, um, you know, and where he is um, my partner in, in geography and in social and political justice and, and that sort of thing, I approach it just from a dietitian perspective of um, wanting people to eat healthy food. So my background, my first um, part of the career um, when I started was working in a weight management center. So basically in that job, I spent eight hours a day, um, 40 hours a week talking to people 
about weight loss. So, um, you know, when you do that, you find out um, why they can't lose weight or what are their struggles or what are their barriers or what are um, the things that prevent them from, from meeting their goals. And that's kind of the best research I've done in my career was, was listening. So um, as I transitioned um, into more of a, a public health role, um, it, that really has, has guided me in a lot of the decisions and, and programming that we've done. So as Josh mentioned, the SNAP-Ed program and the FNAP program together fund nutrition outreach instructors and health educators that are located throughout the state. We just hired three more, so we're up to 47 um, educators, and we currently cover 46 counties. So some of those educators do cross into multiple counties. Um, some target more youth programming, some target more adult programming, um, but we're really focused on um, grassroots um, level change um, with, with nutrition and, and food access. So as I mentioned um, in my early career, I, I listened to people tell me about um, what they were eating and, and why they couldn't eat healthier. And, and from that, I learned no one was eating fruits or vegetables. So that really, um, as I became the director um, for SNAP-Ed and, and my first task, um, I was hired as a public health specialist. And my task was to come up with our, our public health outreach strategy for all of SNAP-Ed for the very first time. So I really had creative freedom with, you know, if I'm gonna change nutrition and obesity in West Virginia, what would I do? So this was definitely one of my goals and it's the one that ties most closely to um, what we're talking about today. Um, and when I did my master's in public health, one of the things I was introduced to was this social ecological model. So um, I don't know what disciplines you're all coming from, but this is a big thing in public health. And it, it really was like a aha moment of this is what, this makes sense to me. You know, I've, I've listened to all these individual people tell me this is why I can't do this, or this is why I can't do that. And it's, you know, my kids won't need it. My husband won't need it. It's not available at my store, you know, these policies at my workplace or, and it really was like, this is what explains all of that. So this is kind of the basis of what I built um, our programming out of um, with SNAP-Ed. So I've just compiled some of my favorite pictures from over the past seven years since I've been in my position. This one came out of really my kind of first independent dive into food access and, and nutrition education. Um, this um, is in McDowell County and um, it came out of funding from the Conservation Fund and they came to me and they said, we want you to do a program with farmers markets and with kids and subsidizing and incentivizing and, and educating and um, we want you to do it. And um, I said, okay, I've never been to McDowell County ever. So, um, you know, I just started reaching out, you know, there isn't a farmer's market in McDowell County. Okay, well, you know, where can we get food? And there's a couple of burgeoning farmers there in McDowell County. So really just doing that legwork um, they didn't have any food ready um, for a farmer's market through the summer. And so one of my colleagues in Williamson said, we'll just wait until fall. Fall, there's plenty of produce in fall, just wait till fall. I said, okay. I said, well, let's just do it at the school. You know, if we need to reach kids, they'll be in school in the fall. So I worked with these farmers and um, we set up what came to be known as the kids market program. And basically we had the farmers, they came to the school, we gave each of the kids $8. They were able to shop, get what they wanted. They had freedom of choice, which as you understand, kids normally don't have a lot of choice in what um, shows up on their dinner table. So, you know, as an empowerment of children to, to make these food choices um, while also assisting families who may um, have needed extra food. And the reason why I like this picture is because having spent four years um, with adults, 
trying to improve their nutrition, I realized how much people dislike vegetables. And so what I see in this picture is like, the mom is just, um, has just as much trepidation about eating the spinach as the child does. So, um, and this is really a theme in West Virginia. It's like, you know, we understand as a dietitian, you know, the, the parents, the gatekeeper. And so we really need to work with them to make sure the food's on the table. Um, but if they don't like it, then it's not going to be on the table. And thus, you know, we talk about food justice. And to me, it was, it, it's an issue of where do kids have any, any um, food justice or food sovereignty? You know, they, they're at the mercy of the adults around them who may or may not be making the best choices for a multitude of reasons. So that's why I picked this picture. It's this, this you know, like, who is making this decision? Are we going to use these kids to influence parents? Are we going to use the parents to influence kids? And, and really, we're trying to do both. So part of the program is you know, let's use the kids to take the message to the parents um, while also assisting the parents by creating kids that will eat vegetables. Um, this is another cool picture of a project that happened this year. This is with Early Head Start. Um, so we started working with the birth to three people who go inside of homes and giving them materials um, to help kind of support our messages. So you can see here, um, the mom's helping the child cut up banana um, on a nice my plate, which is our USDA funder. Um, same thing. This is kind of the educational part of our program. So yes, even though we see the outer influences are important, we're still focused on teaching people that individual behavior, changing knowledge, attitudes, um, skills, you know. So this is um, actually a um, day report in McDowell County as well. And so that's our educator, Jennifer, and she is teaching the gentleman there um, how to cook. This is another picture from McDowell County, another one of my favorites, um, just from one of the markets. And you see again, the child is the one, you know, making that choice, um, you know, investigating um, the produce that's there. This is um, a market which is actually sponsored by Mountaineer Food Bank. So Mountaineer Food Bank heard about what we were doing with kids markets and they said, you know, we could do the same thing, but with donated foods. So um, they actually show up at schools and do the same thing. They, you know, fill kids bags up. Um, as you can see, they've got a large quantity of produce there to take home. Um, so working with our emergency food networks. This is a picture from a, um, a grant that we did in Kanawha County. This is a low income and senior high rise. Um, and I like this picture and I visited all these sites um, as part of the, I, I wrote the grant in partnership with one of our aggregators, which is a farmer that grows and then also aggregates from other places. And, and she visited these sites once a week for six weeks and again, same concept, individuals could come and they could shop for what they needed to a certain amount. Um, the thing I like about this picture is, is thinking about disability and how that impacts our food access. And as you can see, we've got multiple walkers. We had um, you know, people that were coming down to get stuff for other people who were sick or weren't able to walk. Um, and really I had great conversations with, with this group of, of people at this site um, and one thing, just because I'm nervous about showing videos in any sort of presentation, um, I was interviewing a gentleman about the program um, and you can hear in the interview as I was recording gunshots in the background. So as they were hosting the market, one block away, someone was shot, you know, during the market. And again, it just brought to life, you know, here we are dealing with food access and trying to help people, but, but really, community safety is, is, you know, part of the thing that's influencing their accessibility. This is a pharmacy program. So again, kind of taking that, we're subsidizing fresh local produce, um, but connecting it directly to health, um, health care. Um, so working with clinics and they get a prescription from their doctor for um, these foods. Um, so again, tying that, that all in. And just to make a point of all of that, as we're talking about it, 
All of these programs subsidize local farmers. Every dollar that we've gotten to do these programs goes straight to farmers because we are operating it through the SNAP-Ed infrastructure. So we have money to pay staff. We have money to buy cute bags and tokens and recipes and foods for demonstrations and tastings. Um, but the only thing we can't buy with SNAP-Ed money is food that people take home. So we've generated grants to, to, um, to do these programs. And over the course of seven years, which I'm sure April would comment on as we were just talking about, the food system changed. So when we started doing this work, the concept of taking a market to someone versus setting up in a, in a um, gas station parking lot or wherever for a, a short period of time um, was new. That was a new thing. Like, oh, you're gonna do a market at a school? Like, you know, um, what's that about? But, but that's not new anymore. People do it everywhere. They do it statewide. School systems are paying to, to host markets at their schools. So, so there is change. We have changed the food system in some way just by subsidizing it and connecting it back to nutrition and, and education. Um, so another a program that we do is Grow This. So another kind of food sovereignty, you know, taking, taking your um, product, being able to produce your own food. It's like the most revolutionary thing. This is a child care center in, in um, Charleston. You can see the kids. It looks like they have suckers, but those are carrots on the end of a toothpick. So as a dietitian, your food preferences develop probably before you enter school. So we work with the littlest of the little on our programs. On the alternate side, this is a high tunnel in McDowell County. So they're learning real production, um, season extension in middle and high school. This is a community garden that our own educator um, had the land donated by her mom. It's just her mom's lot and they have um, grown food there. And these are families they invite to come to harvest and they can take home the produce and then they're using this community garden to generate the produce to host the kids market. So they've kind of developed their own um, production. And when I say, you know, our educators get their hands dirty, that they literally get down in the dirt. So that's Heather and she's down there digging. This is the early Head Start program. This is a box garden. So again, going into homes and showing families how they can grow gardens within whatever space they have. This is our SNAP stretch program that we work with food and farm on. So if you're not familiar with that, that's doubling or tripling of SNAP dollars. Um, kind of an interesting tie in to things that have happened with COVID and how it's, sometimes we see the silver lining is, um, when, when Spencer and I wrote this grant, we had $50,000 to, to do the incentives. And we were really worried, like there's no way we're gonna even spend that because that means people have to spend $50,000 in SNAP at a farmer's market and that just was not happening. Um, COVID comes, has anyone heard of PEBT? Okay, PEBT gets sent out, but it's not income. It's not income-based. Everyone gets it, right? PEBT is the equalizer. So now we're all on SNAP, right? <laughs> We've all got EBT cards. And all of a sudden it's like, you know, people are shopping at farmer's markets with this EBT and, and we have spent the 50,000 and we've got more from the state, we've gotten more from funders and, and the, the program is going, you know, and, and we use these same tokens at our kids markets. So kids connect, you know, this market at school and this market at the farmer's market and we're all, all integrated. This is a, a food pantry. Um, we have we've got a very large Walmart foundation grant, which seems ironic in our food access work, but it we'll take it. Um, so we were able to purchase refrigeration units for food pantries because if they wanna offer fresh local produce, they have to store it, have cold storage. So this is another example of kind of hitting each sector and, and what the needs are and making sure everyone has access. And then finally, the newest revolution of, of kids programming. Um, so we did the kids markets. We do the kids markets a lot. April can attest to there's a lot of kids markets. They're logistically challenging. It's, it's a lot of time, it's a lot of effort. When COVID came, the schools shut it down. They said, you can't come, you can't set up a market, but you can bring bags of produce. 
But what that did is it took the choice away. So instead of letting kids shop and see and experience, it was just, here's a bag of food, take it. Um, I didn't like that because it, it was, the essence was lost. And then one of our colleagues um, who recently left the School of Public Health in a conversation said, part of food justice is people need to be able to get food in the way that everyone gets food, right? You know, everyone gets food pretty much at the store or farmer's market. So we're taking the kids market concept to the store. So same concept, I'm gonna subsidize local produce. We're gonna set up a stand inside of a normal store and we're gonna tell kids, you get to choose for free produce that you would like. Um, again, this is all funded through, through funders. So this actually just happened this week. This is a Piggly Wiggly in Work County. They set up this really neat display. Um, they found these, this old display from a Halos display is what he told me. Um, and so we had a hundred families that had signed up. Um, he set up this display and put it on his Facebook page and we have 50 more that signed up overnight and I've run out of, of materials. But, you know, just again, how do we keep bringing local produce and expanding it and along with April, like we talked about earlier, the chicken and the egg, you know, we keep getting the funding to subsidize them and they're working on making sure they have the production capacity to, to, to fulfill what our needs are and so on and so on. And, and maybe some, sometime in the next 10 or 15 years when these childcare kids or, or all these kids we worked with become adults, they will be consumers of local produce. So this is a long game. It's not, it's not a short game, but, um, but really that's the work that we're trying to do is, is, is build up our own food capacity in the state, create a future generation of consumers at the same time. So maybe we will, at the end of this, come together and it's like this perfect joining of, of forces. So it's a little bit about what we do. Um, so now I have the pleasure of introducing Marion, who created this lovely meal for us. And when we had our call, was that this week or last week? I can't remember. Um, he said, just talk about cool things about him. <laughs> so I think the coolest thing is he was West Virginia Living's um, best chef fall of 2015, but I think that he's the best chef, right, um, all the time. He's a 12th generation West Virginian. He grew up on a small farm and he's a badass chef. So those are cool things about him and I'm sure he'll tell you more, but Marianne, if you'd like to take it away. Um. Doing this dinner here today, or this uh, spread of appetizers, reminds me of the last dinner we did right before COVID shut everything down. And it was a dinner for 300 people in Charleston for a bunch of the uh, movers and shakers and most important people in West Virginia, I think you could say. And uh, at one of our most venerable institutions down there. And it was a wonderful evening. Uh, but we were there to do Appalachian food. And people kept walking up to me and asking what everything was and commenting how exotic it all was. And I thought this was the strangest thing because this is our food. And I, I think there are a lot of Appalachians who don't know what our food is anymore. Um, we were doing what I would call modern takes on old school Appalachian, um, a lot of Eastern European, um, a lot of African American, um, and a lot of, little bit of everything in between. Uh, obviously some, some uh, things with roots in British and Irish and Swiss and German, French, Spanish, uh, all the folks that came to America first or West Virginia first or Virginia as it was when my family came here, Virginia territory. And, the whole evening people are asking what these things were. And I was kind of baffled by it because I thought everybody knew what these things were. Um, and it kind of brings up the question, what is Appalachian food? What is Appalachian cuisine? And I don't think there's really an answer. Um, when people talk traditional Appalachian or authentic Appalachian, and I think, well, whose grandma are you asking? You know, it all depends on where you were raised in West Virginia, 
and what your family roots are as to what your idea of traditional or authentic Appalachian would be. I think the majority of us ate venison, or as we called it till I got educated, deer meat, um, a lot of potatoes, a lot of turnips and rutabagas and a lot of corn. Uh, these things were normal. I think everybody in some way found a way to use these. Um, my family are Swiss on both sides, but one of my best friends is Italian American, Italian Appalachian. If you ask him what he thinks what Appalachian food is, he would tell you something completely different. One of my best friends is Indian Appalachian, born here, his parents came over in the 60s. You ask him what he thinks Appalachian is, he'd tell you something completely different. So uh, my wife asked her aunt who's Filipina who was born here, she'd tell you something completely different. Yeah, everybody here would have a different idea of what we think Appalachian is. But I think we would all agree that one thing that has happened is we've lost a lot of it. And I don't have answers about the idea of food justice and equality, but I think we could come a lot closer to finding those answers if we would get back in touch with the roots of our food, um, with the indigenous ingredients that we have to work with here, with growing it ourselves and with raising our own meat. Um, a lot more hunting, I think, could be done by folks on this side of the political divide, not just by the rednecks, because if we can provide our own food, well, that's a beautiful thing. Um, I think um, getting back in touch with those roots a little bit more all the time could be maybe the answer to, if not all of the problems here, I think it could be a key to finding some of the answers to these problems. Um, I, said, I said, I don't do a lot of this. When I do this, and I actually do a fair amount of this, it's usually question and answers. So I'm not used to just standing here and trying to continue a narrative. Um, I know we are going to take questions here at the end and not being an academic, I'm not gonna just keep going. Um, I will start with the questions and answers here and everybody else is gonna get involved with this who can come on back up here in it. Again, I do wanna thank everybody for coming out for this. We wanna thank you for the honor of providing the food for this and asking our thoughts and opinions on this because it's an important thing. As a small restaurant here, um, Alegria and I came to West Virginia 18 years ago I am, of course, from here. She is from Tucson. And we came back here 18 years ago and opened our first restaurant 16 years ago. And we closed our last restaurant last June. Um, not last June, just this past June. Um, COVID had a lot to do with it, but it was also a real lack of interest in, in Appalachian food. Um, we had when it came to our seafood, we had trout that was raised in West Virginia and walleye, pike that came from Pennsylvania, uh, Erie, Lake Erie, just up above us, catfish that was raised in West Virginia and people would continually ask why we didn't have salmon. What they really wanted was salmon. Uh, we had, last spring we put on a burgoo as our soup and I uh, hope everybody here knows what burgoo is. We have a town named after it. If you don't, it's a, basically a stew generally made with wild game, um, but our dish was with lamb. And nobody knew what burgoo was and nobody bought it, but we did get lots of requests for French onion soup. And there were more requests for French onion soup than there were people buying our actual Appalachian soup or stew. And it's, I won't call it disheartening. I think we are moving forward slowly, but our last restaurant, Richwood Grill, was open for over a decade and it was small. And when that building was bought out by a developer, everybody's heard this story of Morgantown, bought out by a big developer and they kicked us out of our cute little space. We were very successful then. And when we moved to our much larger space at Hill and Hollow, thinking there was this renewed interest in Appalachian cuisine, but what we found was there wasn't as much interest as we really hoped there would be. There was you know, the same 60 seats full of people wanting our Appalachian food, another 150 seats full of people 
who were just there because it was a nice place and they wanted the usual stuff you get everywhere else. Um, I think this is sad. I think this is very sad. If you go anywhere else in America, and I have lived all over this country, I'm fortunate enough to have been born with wanderlust. Um, I come from a small farm and no money in my family, but I have managed to make it across five continents, almost 50 countries and all 50 states. And I can tell you there's no place like West Virginia. We are unique. There's nobody like us. There's nobody like this place anywhere you go. We're not even like the rest of Appalachia. We're not like Tennessee or Georgia or North Carolina. We are unique in our own. And I think it's time we stood up and started reclaiming more of our heritage and inviting more people to share in our heritage and be a part of this wonderful thing, wonderful thing that we have here and take a, a lot of that pride back. And um, yeah, thank you all so much. This has been great. Please enjoy the food, drink and exhibition. Thank Go you. Get some food, y'all. Yes, please do. <laughs>